Uh, how was the lecture yesterday? Was it interesting? It's a fascinating area, right? I think hopefully you'll see a lot of fascinating topics in, in this class going forward. It's, you're, you're really getting the cutting edge in computer architecture and how it interacts with other areas around it. And there's a lot more to come. Maybe, maybe t two years from now, when I'm teaching this class, I will have real systems that are doing some of the genome analysis. And I'll be able to point, just like I was able to point an unvolatile memory uh, at the beginning of this class, right? At the beginning of the first day of the class. Okay, uh, so this is uh, what we're going to finish today. If you recall, we were discussing Rowhammer, and then I had to go and give a talk about Rowhammer in some other place. That's why you had the lecture yesterday. <laughs> Now it feels like kind of deja vu because I talked about Rowhammer last week here, I talked about Rowhammer yesterday or two days ago, and now I'm going to talk about Rowhammer again. <laughs> but it's an important topic, that's why it's all over the place. <laughs> okay, if you remember Rowhammer, this is, uh, well, hopefully you remember. <laughs> Everybody remembers Rowhammer? Yes, that's good. <laughs> so I don't need to go over this again. Basically, it's, it's really the first example of a simple hardware failure mechanism that can create a widespread system security vulnerability. And I've been looking at finding other hardware failure mechanisms that can accomplish the same thing. And so far, we have not been able to find anything before that comes before Rowhammer. Let's see what happens in the future, of course. So whenever you're thinking about this, it's always good to think, are there other failure mechanisms that could lead to similar security vulnerabilities? They don't necessarily need to be exactly the same mechanism, but are there other mechanisms that lead to bit flips that could lead to security vulnerabilities that could lead to, or, or uh, that generate some other uh, problems like Spectre or Meltdown? Okay, oh, click the wrong thing. So that's, that's a failure mechanism, right? You get the blank screen. <laughs> it used to be the blue screen during my times. <laughs> Okay, so let's see. So we were talking about solutions. This is just to jog your memory. We discussed a bunch of solutions to the problem. And if you recall, we talked about two types of solutions, protecting immediate, uh, having immediate solutions, protecting the chips that are vulnerable out in the field. This is really necessary, otherwise you would be vulnerable in pretty much all of the systems that are out there that have vulnerable chips. And we discussed that you have limited possibilities. That's always the case. You always have limited possibilities for protection in chips that are in, in systems that are out in the field, right? Unless you somehow provisioned for this and built patchable systems. We will also talk about. If, for example, we had a reconfigurable memory controller that was out there in the systems, perhaps we could reconfigure the memory controller to do something different when it sees many activates to some number of rows, right? But we don't have that. If you remember, memory controllers today do scheduling with very rigid uh, principles. First, uh, it's uh, the first ready, first come, first serve policy, for example, prioritize row hit requests over others and older requests over others. And that's very rigid. That's baked into hardware. You cannot change it. And there's almost no programmability in the memory controller today. Whereas if you had this programmable memory controller, if you could, for example, run code in your memory controller, you could implement a solution to Rowhammer and run it to your memory controller. But that doesn't exist today, that's why these immediate uh, solutions uh, have limited possibilities. Make sense? But going forward, maybe that should change, right? If, if you think of hardware design as being unreliable, and if you think of security as preventing unforeseen consequences, maybe the hardware we design should be a lot more patchable. Once you put it out in the field, if you discover vulnerabilities, that's okay, you patch the hardware. Just like we patch the software today, right? Yes? If it's patchable, it will not. It's will not. You can inject malicious code inside your memory. So that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great point, of course. If it's patchable now, it could open up some other security vulnerabilities, which you should really provision for and design the systems that way. I saw some, someone, uh, a hacker, which had injected uh, malicious code in his own uh, hard drive memory uh -huh. controller and it could reprogram this and it could do anything you want it on it. So yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's uh, already uh, the memory <laughs> also. I think more, more uh, capacity possibilities make it, makes it even more memorable. Uh, that could be true uh, if you don't design it well. So if you don't design uh, that patchability in a secure way, right? Certainly, whatever complexity you add to the system always increases your 
uh, increase your uh, attack of surface. Right. And in, in adding patchability, uh, programmability in the system certainly increase your surface so, or surface of attack. Right. So you need to be very careful when you're doing these. I agree with that. Absolutely. So that's the right mindset, I think. Whenever you're trying to fix a security problem, you should not be causing other security problems. <coughs> okay? Okay. So longer-term solutions, I think what we're already discussing, the longer-term solutions, patchability could be one mechanism. But to protect future DRAM chips, we have a much wider range of protection mechanisms. Right? We can change the DRAM chips, we can change the memory controllers, even though we may not make them patchable, we can change them to fix the roll hammer type of problems. Uh, and we discussed both types of solutions last time. Uh, we didn't go into details of seven solutions, but you're reading the paper, hopefully. How many of you have read, read the paper already? Okay, that's good. That's a good uh, fraction of the people. Have you already entered your reviews into the review system? Not yet. Okay, you're, you're still thinking about uh, the strengths and weaknesses. Did you like the paper? Is it interesting? Okay, cool. Well, hopefully you'll read a lot of interesting papers during the semester. And we've discussed para, probabilistic adjacent drug activation as the best solution. Uh, and um, so this is, I, I, this is, again, just to jog your memory, right? This is the immediate solution that's already employed in the field today. Basically, increase the refresh rates. And uh, I'd like to point out a couple of things over here. Uh, this is Apple's security release. First of all, they acknowledge the problem very cleanly. Uh, and they say they increase the memory refresh rates to solve the problem. But they don't say how much they increase the memory refresh rates. This is also interesting. I believe it's about 2x. I don't think it's 4x. I think 4x would be a lot in terms of energy and uh, performance overhead. 2x is still a lot, because we, remember, we refresh is wasting energy and performance. You really don't want to do this across the board. But they have to do it, because they have to close the vulnerability somehow. I don't think this gets rid of all of the vulnerability, but probably reduces uh, the vulnerability uh, somewhat. Uh, it's probably good to research how, how, how well this fixes the problem. Although that's a very practical research area, right? In our results, for example, we showed that you need to increase the refresh rate by 7x to get rid of every single error that you see. If you read the paper or if you remember the last lecture, that's what I said. And remember, I also said that uh, the attacks that we developed at that time were not the best attacks. Meaning, uh, the best attack really hammers uh, a row in the maximal possible rate. Right? But our attacks were not hammering a row at the maximal possible rate. This is called the maximum, uh, basically, uh, Google developed this attack where you could hammer a row sandwiched between two other rows, right? You basically hammer two rows uh, that sandwich one row, and that leads to a higher uh, number of attacks, a higher number of bit flips. So that may actually increase the refresh rate that you really need. So this is actually a very hairy solution, I think, if you think about it. But this is really the only solution uh, that is really easy to implement in existing systems. You basically uh, add a security release like this, and it patches the BIOS, and the BIOS basically increases the refresh rate automatically. Right? That's the idea. And that's the level of programmability you have in the memory controller. That's why this works, and this helps. Okay, but you know very well that we want to actually get rid of refresh. Refresh is a very bad problem for scaling DRAM. We've already discussed all of this. So clearly this should... Uh, make you think that you, you don't want to solve a scaling problem by making another scaling problem worse. That's another fundamental principle, I think. Ideally, you would like to scale memory. And row hammer is a problem that's, that we see when we're scaling memory. Refresh is another scaling problem. You don't want to exacerbate one of the other scaling problems to solve one scaling problem. That's a terrible solution in principle, in general. Okay, But that's what we have today. That's why this is implemented in all of industry's memory controllers today. Okay, but maybe a more uh, uh, promising solution direction is this. This is, as I mentioned, this is a memory controller that was released by Intel relatively recently. And they basically give the uh, uh, user a choice in the BIOS. So you could pick hardware row hammer protection, or you could pick 2x refresh in this case. If you pick hardware row hammer protection, basically this gives you uh, whether you do refreshes to the adjacent rows at what probability. Basically, every, uh, I think in this case, 2 to the 10. Every 2 to the 10 activates, you do a refresh to the adjacent rows. Right? That's what the memory controller does. Of course, we also discussed the downside of the solution. How does the memory controller know which rows are physically adjacent? 
in this case there's not enough information provided, but my guess is that the memory controller basically makes a simplistic assumption that whenever you're accessing row x, x plus 1 and x minus 1 are adjacent, and it sends refreshes to those rows, but that may not be true, right? Now if that's not true, that's not preventing the vulnerability in all cases, which means that you're still vulnerable if someone figures out uh, that you're not refreshing the really physically adjacent rows and attacks those physically adjacent rows. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. So this is a solution in the right direction, but it doesn't have enough information communicated from the memory to the memory controller. I think having that information communicated from memory to the memory controller telling which rows are adjacent could be useful in many different purposes. Row hammer is a very good example. Okay. Any thoughts? Any questions? Does anybody have this option in their BIOS? Sorry, I'll, I'll take your question. Have you seen it? Have you, have you messed with your BIOS a little bit to see if you have that option? I'd recommend checking it. Yes? Yes, yeah, so I, I know there are more solutions than these two, but sure. between these two options, the 2x refresh and the probabilistic activation, sure. the only downside of the probabilistic is what you mentioned being the like the non-real adjacency, right? So that's one downside. Uh, the other downside is basically you need to know what the probability should be, right? And that's really depend on how many uh, activates uh, that, uh, what, is the, what is the minimum number of activates you can do on this chip to induce row hammer? But otherwise, the energy to, to implement this is, is much less than the energy to do the time Absolutely, yeah. You can, you can even do the calculation. Actually, this could be a good question in you know, a homework or even an exam, right? <laughs> you could calculate the energy that's required for 2x refresh versus based on a probability, or you could even uh, come up with a closed form equation, right, mm -hmm. uh, to calculate the energy. Is there energy overhead just to implement this? Or uh, yeah, there should be energy overhead. You can think of basically, you need to basically keep a counter. And uh, every 512 times, or every, every n times, the counter saturates, and when the counter saturates, you issue a refresh, right? So there's, I think that's a very small energy overhead, though. It's a very small counter. Modern chips have billions of transistors, as you know, so it's not going to make a huge difference, I think. Okay, yes, please. Uh, why would the rows at x plus 1, x minus 1 not be physically adjacent? Yeah, so uh, we discussed this last time, and you, it'll become more clear when you read the paper. But uh, from the memory controller's perspective, these rows uh, are logical row addresses. Internally, DRAM remaps the addresses. And th there are multiple reasons for doing this remapping. One could be, for example, uh, the row at x plus 1 is for some reason faulty. right? And the DRAM manufacturer determined that it was faulty. Normally, there's additional redundancy added to the rows in DRAM. If, you, if, if the manufacturer determines that a row is faulty, there's some remapping logic internally that they can change such that they map this address of the row to some other physical row internally. That way, uh, they can operate the chip still uh, without losing yield, even though you may have faulty rows. This is called row-level redundancy, basically. Uh, similarly, DRAM chips have column-level redundancy. You can, you can map one column to another column if you find out one column is, for some reason, faulty. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's one reason. There are, there are other reasons also. They, sometimes they, uh, they do some remapping internally so that uh, they want to balance the power, for example. Of course, those details are not very, uh, very public. Actually, none of these details are public, but um, they just want to do some internal remapping uh, for reliability and uh, power purposes. Yes? If you have what row system? Like, if we have multiple processes and all are accessing uh, I see. Like memory, and there are different applications running on different cores, so in that case, the probability, fixing one probability for this row handler issue might not be the optimal. I see. It will depend on the application where you hmm. So basically, I think you're trying to propose a mechanism that could make this more efficient, right? So I think the, the way I like to think of it is basically this is, you, you pick some, uh, some probability that gets rid of all the errors. But the applications may not be really accessing memory as fast, right? They may be accessing at a lower rate. In that case, you're issuing some refreshes, maybe unnecessarily, right? I, I agree with that. 
You could play tricks like that, but you, should, you need to make sure that you don't compromise security. Basically, can you make this application aware? Maybe, I don't know. I can talk to some of the TAs about this, maybe Girai in the back. Okay, these are good questions. Any others? Any thoughts? If you have a system, I'd recommend playing with your BIOS and checking if you have this sort of protection. <laughs> okay, so this is the paper you're reading. Some of you have already read. Uh, but I think the takeaway we finished with last time was this, basically. I think if you want some sort of security, you need at least some sort of intelligence in your controller. Probabilistic adjacent row activation is a very small amount of intelligence, actually. It's not, it's not a lot of intelligence, if you think about it. But it's slightly more intelligent than what we have today. Okay, and we've already discussed that industry is actually writing papers about these intelligent or slightly intelligent controllers too, right? We, or, we already covered this paper that is written by two companies that don't normally talk to each other. And I don't think they've written any papers after this together <laughs> or before this. If you find evidence against what I just said, please let me know. I'm very curious about uh, which companies actually write papers together. Uh, but basically, uh, if you remember this, uh, these folks uh, from the memory controller group at Intel and DRM circuit design group at uh, Samsung, they wrote this paper together and they basically said some of these problems are too difficult to solve at the DRM device level. Refresh, write latency and variable retention time. At that time they didn't want to talk about Rohammer, of course. Uh, uh, and they, they suggested that it's better to design some more intelligent controllers that can help the process scaling. So this, uh, what, what we discussed with probabilistic adjacent row activation is one example of that co-architecting controllers and DRAM together. Right? DRAM provides information about which rows are adjacent. Memory controller has a very simple mechanism to probabilistically refresh adjacent rows uh, at low probability that would prevent the errors. That's exactly an example of co-architecting controllers and DRAM. Uh, uh, Raider was another example of co-architecting controllers and DRAM getting rid of refreshes. So these are all examples that are really enhancing process scaling from real life. Okay, okay. so uh, maybe we'll have some lectures on flash memory also, but uh, as I mentioned, uh, we already have intelligent controllers, and you alluded to this also in the hard disks, for example. If you have a hard disk, you actually have processors in your hard disk that manage uh, both access to hard disk as well as uh, reliability issues in your hard disk. Basically, you, have, you implement strong ECC, strong error correction codes. Uh, they do a lot of different sorts of things like very leveling. Uh, that's true for SSDs also. In an SSD, you have um, an intelligent memory controller, usually some sort of combination of processors plus hardwired logic. There are some reconfigurable components also. In this case, we actually built an FPGA-based uh, SSD flash memory controller. I'm not going to cover all of these papers, but uh, we, when we have a lecture on flash memory, we may talk about it. But if you look at uh, an SSD controller, it's relatively intelligent, actually. Uh, what it does is it implements error correcting code, and in fact, very heavy error correcting codes. Today, uh, these SSD controllers are implementing much more sophisticated error correcting codes like LDPC codes, low density parity check codes. They actually have multiple levels of error correction. They try to correct the errors with simple mechanisms. If error errors are not connected with simple mechanisms, they try to move to more sophisticated mechanisms, for example. They handle refresh. They refresh memory once in a while. They handle read-disturb issues, similar to Rohammer, but not exactly the same mechanisms. They, they try to uh, find the read reference voltages in flash memory such that they could minimize the errors when they're reading. So there are many, 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 many mechanisms that are already employed in these controllers and they're very sophisticated. And they're all there to make flash memory work. Flash memory is actually very interesting. Hopefully we'll have a lecture. We'll see how the things go. But if we have that lecture, you will see that uh, flash memory is a technology where uh, you manufacture it and a lot of the bits don't work. What, what really makes it work is the controller that's intelligent. So it's a perfect example of co-architecting a controller and memory together so that we can have a memory that's useful. And clearly this is useful, right? It's, it's enabled cell phones like this. this is, I think this is here because we have flash memory inside. Okay, so we, we actually have these intelligent memory controllers. So what's the difference in DRAM? So uh, there's actually, uh, if you think about memory hierarchy, uh, hard disks, flash memory, uh, these are very different from DRAM because these are treated as part of the storage subsystem. 
and they're slow. The devices are slow. So there are two differences. One is the devices are slow, they're persistent, and they're treated as part of the storage subsystem. So there's a lot of latency to access these devices, which means that the controller can do a lot of tasks it, uh, during that time. Right? A flash memory access takes, for example, a microsecond. Right? In, in a microsecond, you can actually implement a lot of different error correction codes relatively easy. A DRAM access, on the other hand, uh, the DRAM, DRAM's difference is the device is extremely fast, comparatively. Uh, it's not persistent, so it's volatile. It's usually used for working storage or working memory. Uh, and uh, beca because it's used for working memory, it's directly accessible by the program. So whenever you write a program, you're accessing a memory allocation directly in DRAM. And people want that access to be fast. So if you want to make the memory controller intelligent, you cannot add extreme sophistication. Right? Because the latency is a bottleneck. You don't want to, uh, the device has 50 nanosecond latency, let's say, you don't want that latency to go to one microsecond. Because otherwise you're wasting your device. Because you have this expensive DRAMs, much more expensive than SSD per bit. Okay, so that's why, uh, even though we have these intelligent controller mechanisms over here, the mindset is similar, but if you want to have an intelligent memory controller in DRAM, you should be a lot more careful in terms of how you design it, how you implement it. It needs to be fast. Make sense? Okay, again, this is very fundamental, right? This is, again, uh, cost versus latency trade-off. We have these huge storage devices uh, that, are, that are high latency, and we can afford to make the controllers extremely intelligent over here. But then we have this relatively small storage device, DRAM, that's extremely expensive and fast, and we cannot afford to make the controller extremely intelligent. We need to be very careful in designing. But the high-level idea is similar. This is called the flash translation layer. In the flash, tr uh, and maybe we should have a DRAM translation layer also to manage the memory. And going forward, things will look more like this, as, especially when we have PCM, DRAM, and hybrid memory, as we will discuss later. Okay, so this is just a foreshadowing. We might assign this paper later on, but uh, we've been doing a lot of research in flash memory also. And this is an invited paper that we wrote. Uh, actually, this paper took us one and a half years to write. Uh, it's, it's the result of uh, like eight years of research that we've done in the area plus others have done in the area because it's really a survey paper that really talks about many uh, ideas that have gone into uh, making these flash memory based stall state drives work uh, in terms of reliability. We didn't even talk about performance as much in this work. So these are all really reliability mechanisms. I don't remember how many pages, but it's probably around 29, 30 pages over here. But I'd recommend you take a look at this if you're interested in this area. It's, it's very fascinating. And when we have a lecture on flash memory, you will also see that flash memory was really experiencing scaling problems until very recently as well. You had this planar flash memory, which is two-dimensional, and people were reducing the size of the uh, cell as much as possible, and they went all the way down to almost 10 nanometers. Almost. And they figured out that the error rate was increasing like crazy, a huge amount. <laughs> so your control needs to be extremely sophisticated. They tried to increase the error correction codes, but they found out that it's actually not so easy to build these devices. And there was a breakthrough. Uh, in around 2015 or so. Uh, basically what, uh, what flash manufacturers were able to do was, as opposed to increasing capacity by reducing the size of the cell, they were able to stack multiple cells on top of each other. This is called 3D stacking or uh, vertical stacking in flash memory. It's also called 3D NAND. And this was actually, this, this relieved the scaling problem for some time. What happened was, uh, they, they stopped reducing the size of the cell. Go, uh, they, they basically, uh, redu uh, the feature size was around 10 nanometers, let's say. They increased the feature size to 35, 40 nanometers again, which means that the cell became much bigger. But what they did was they added a lot more stacks on top of each other. Initially, they started with 32, then it became 48, 64. I believe right now they're at 128, although I'm not sure if they really disclose all of that information at this point. So basically, that's another way of scaling, right? If you can do, go three-dimensional, maybe the cell size doesn't need to be as big. Of course, there's a fundamental trade-off again, right? If you go three-dimensional, then you have a heat problem because not, where will heat ex escape? And also, how many layers can you stack? Like, what is the end? At some point, you may not be able to stack as much for reliability reasons or for power reasons, for thermal reasons. Then that's the question. Then what do you do at, the, at that point? Well, you go back to reducing the cell size. 
So this 3D stacking may buy some scaling uh, margin, let me call it that way, uh, in the sense that it, it, it gives you breathing room to actually scale uh, the technology to much higher capacities for some time. But if that 3D stacking is not infinite, then you'll, you're back to reducing the cell size. And we're actually seeing that already. Uh, the manufacturers are both reducing the cell size as well as adding more stacks today so they can maximize the capacity. <coughs> So these are actually really fundamental principles. I'm talking about these, uh, even though we're not having the flash memory lecture, but keep this in mind, I think. Three, uh, 2D stacking gives you only two dimensions to scale. 3D stack stacking enables you to scale better by adding another dimension. But uh, there are thermal issues related to that now. Right? Okay, this paper actually talks about 3D stacking a little bit also, but uh, uh, we need to write another paper talking about 3D stacking, I think. <laughs> There's a lot more to do in that area. Okay, any questions? Okay, I see people are interested. <laughs> okay, basically I think the takeaway is main memory needs intelligent controllers. And I think we, we know this very well from the uh, uh, fla flash example. That's also true for hard disk, but I'm not going to go into the hard disk right now. That could be another lecture at some point. It's also fascinating. Although I think of hard disks as relatively old technology these days. <laughs> Which is true, but it will not go away. As long as it has a cost advantage, all technologies will also not, not go away. So how many of you have used tape, tapes as a storage medium? Okay, you have used them. Anybody else? Okay, that's good. Like when I first started programming, that was my storage media. Basically, I had a tape, I had a tape recorder, and you would, you would connect that to the computer, and you would basically read uh, from that persistent media as a tape. It's like a cassette player, right? <laughs> it's exactly the same thing, actually. So those things are actually extremely dense, and they're non-volatile, and they're still there. They're still used, actually. For cold data, for example, and these big internet companies, they have a lot of tapes. And that's where some of the cold data is stored, because it's extremely cheap, much cheaper than SSDs. And much, much cheap, um, clearly much, much cheaper than DRAM, but also much cheaper than hard disks. So even all technologies are around. But of course, we're not going to talk about tape over here. <laughs> okay. Okay, so let's talk about this a little bit. I think we've covered some of this, so I'm going to go relatively quickly. But uh, clearly, DRAM is becoming more, uh, less reliable and more vulnerable. And I've given you uh, this example from the study that we did with Facebook. I'm not going to cover that again. But basically, the takeaway is uh, if... Uh, the, the failure rate that you see on a server increases uh, or correlates positively with the chip density that you employ in the server. <coughs> and if, you have, if you're interested in more results, you should take a look at this paper. I haven't assigned this paper, but I cannot assign you all the papers that I talk about briefly, clearly. But there's a lot of evidence in the field that this failure rate is increasing. And Rohammer is a great example of that, uh, one of the reasons failure rate is increasing, right? Actually, we've done similar studies on flash memory failures as well. Again, with Facebook, uh, my student Justin, who graduated recently, uh, actually spent a lot of time in uh, Facebook and analyzed a lot of data. Uh, and we found out that actually similar trends exist in flash memory as well. This is, this is a fascinating paper also that I'm not going to talk about. When we get to flash memory, when we, maybe we will talk about it. But basically, any time memory scales, you become less reliable, which means that you also become more vulnerable. And uh, Due to difficulties in DRAM scaling, other problems may also appear, or they may be going unnoticed. It's also good to think about it this way. Um, some areas may already be slipping into the field, and we have good reason to believe that this may be happening because Rohammer slipped into the field, right? This is not supposed to happen, but it did happen. And I believe that's true for retention errors also. We may be getting retention errors, especially in very dense memory chips today, because it's very difficult for the manufacturers to capture and correct for all of these retention errors to figure out, uh, to basically ensure that all of the cells that don't satisfy uh, a refresh rate are eliminated. It's very difficult to do that, I think, for the reasons that we discussed earlier, but we're going to discuss a little bit more in detail. There could be read errors, there could be write errors. These are also hard to figure out, probably. And these errors are reliability problems, for sure. They could be causing uh, reliability issues, but also they may pose security vulnerabilities. For example, if you find out that a cell is failing once in a while because it doesn't retain data for long enough, 
uh, and the refreshes don't fix it because uh, it needs to be refreshed more often, then this may actually pose a security vulnerability. Right? If someone actually figures this out, uh, I don't know how, but attackers are actually very smart in general. You should always, whenever you're thinking about security, you should always think that your adversary, adversary is extremely smart and has a lot of resources. That's a great way of designing a secure system. You should never think that your adversary is not capable. Your adversary is extremely capable and even more powerful than you. That's how you can beat them. <laughs> right. So uh, people may actually exploit these retention errors if they're really happening uh, in the field. And this is another good area of potential research, right? Finding out if these retention errors are actually happening in the field. Okay, we've already discussed this, uh, but I'm going to cover this a little bit more, uh, just a little bit more, not too much more. But basically, determining the data retention time of a cell or row is getting more difficult, and these may be already slipping into the field. And I briefly talked about this paper when we talked about DRM refresh. This is actually the first paper we wrote with the uh, FPGA-based infrastructure we developed for memory controllers. Now that it's open source, other people are using that infrastructure actually also and writing a lot of papers about it. Uh, but the reason we, if you remember, the reason we actually, actually developed that infrastructure was to test DRAM for retention errors. And that's essentially what we did in this work. And you already know that there are two major reasons why uh, retention time profiling is not easy or determining the minimum retention time of a DRAM cell is not easy. One is data pattern dependence of retention time. I'll go into a little bit more detail in this one. Uh, I know you know this. Have you assigned this paper? I don't think so, right? I don't think this was one of the papers. Maybe we'll assign it in one of the homeworks. So please make a note of that. Uh, and the second is variable retention time phenomenon. So let's take a look at these in a little bit more detail, although we covered it. And if you have any ideas or thoughts, please let me know. So basically, this we've seen in Rowhammer also, right? In Rowhammer, the vulnerability of a cell depends on its value and the values of the cells around it because of coupling, uh, essentially uh, coupling noise that you have. And the coupling noise depends on the voltages that you have in the cell, as well as the cells around you. That's true for retention time also. Retention time of a DRAM cell depends on its value and the values of the cells nearby it. Let's take a look at why this is the case in a little bit more detail. Let's take a look at this picture. This is a DRAM cell. Let's assume this is the cell we are uh, concerned about. It may have some failures. When you activate the row for the cell, this is the row. You basically apply high voltage to the word line. And all of the bit lines are perturbed simultaneously over here. As you can see over here. Basically, uh, there's electrical noise on the bit line. And that affects the reliable sensing of the DRAM cell, which is this bit line, right? If you're concerned about the cell, there's some noise in this bit line that you normally have when you're accessing and when you're not accessing. That noise is always there. And that noise is... Uh, essentially uh, affected by the values of nearby cells, like these two, because of bit line to bit line coupling. So you have coupling between this bit line and this bit line and this bit line and this bit line. Uh, basically you have voltage differences and those voltage differences essentially affect uh, the noise, the magnitude of the noise, and that affect the leakage rate, essentially. That's bit line to bit line coupling, that's one reason. But there's also bit line to word line coupling, that's another type of coupling mechanism, and people actually uh, developed a lot of theory, circuit theory related to this in the past. Uh, and this is basically, you have coupling between this bit line and this word line, uh, in this activated word line. And that also affects the electrical noise that you have in the bit line, which means that that affects the leakage rate uh, that you have in this cell. That's the idea. And clearly that noise depends on the values that you have in nearby cells. Right? If, this, if the nearby cells uh, don't have a huge voltage differential compared to this cell, then the noise is lower. Okay, so but what this means is because of these underlying mechanisms, the retention time of a cell depends on the data pattern stored in nearby cells. Which means that, what is the architectural implication? I've given you a little bit more detail to the underneath, right, the circuit level. You don't need to understand all of this, of course, but there's a lot of circuit microelectronic design theory that goes into this noise, and people have tried to model that noise. So there's a lot of research in that area at the lower level. We're not going to cover that. But given that this is the case, you have this data pattern dependence phenomenon, and what are the architectural implications? The architectural implications are you need to find the worst data pattern to find the worst case retention time. Right. And it turns out this pattern is location dependent. So basically you may have a, a, a data pattern over here, but in some other subarray your data pattern may be different because of how the subarray is constructed. I'm not going to go into those details also, but there are differences in how subarrays are constructed in DM internally. Uh, 
And that leads to differences in the data patterns that induce the worst case retention time for different cells. Now you can imagine that this is a hairy problem, right? How do you find that data pattern? You can do a lot of testing. You can, do te you can test with many, many data patterns. And you hope, to you hope that you will uh, find a data pattern that will lead to the minimum retention time. But how do you guarantee that you find it? Not easy. <laughs> Even if you're the DRI manufacturer, it's not easy. I think because now you need to figure out what is the data pattern in all different parts of your chip. And you need to do the testing. Uh, maybe you, maybe their manufacturers uh, can be smarter in the testing because they know exactly how they design the circuit and they can guess what are likely worst case patterns com uh, and what are not likely worst case patterns. Right? That's easier to do if you know exactly what the circuit looks like. But still, it's a lot of testing that they need to do. Okay? So that's why this is not easy, and there may be retention failures that are slipping into the field. In some cases, people may have missed the worst case pattern, or they, may, they didn't have enough time to test during manufacturing time. And maybe someone will figure out the data, worst data pattern. I don't know. This is not easy, I think. Maybe this is hard to exploit, but there might be a way. Okay, the second one is even harder, I think. This is the variable retention time phenomenon that we discussed. By the way, before we go into the second one, any, any thoughts on the data pattern dependence problem? Any solutions? Any brilliant ideas? I'd be surprised if there is a brilliant idea, but who knows? I've been surprised before. Not an easy problem. Okay, if you find something, let me know. <laughs> okay, let's move to the second one. The second one is, I think, even harder. Because at least with the data pattern dependence, you can guess what could be a bad data pattern dependence if you actually uh, think about the circuit. But here, there is no opportunity to even guess because it's really a completely random process, as we've discussed. This variable retention time, and this is the uh, phenomenon that the retention time of a DRAM cell changes randomly over time. A cell alternates between multiple retention time states. And I discussed this last time briefly, but I think the slide doesn't exist at that time uh, when I put it up. It did exist, but it wasn't in the slides. Uh, basically, what happens, uh, th there's an underlying cause for it also, which was discovered in late 1980s, in 1987, in a seminal paper published by Yeni uh, in IEDM, uh, I guess International Electron Devices Meeting. Uh, that's where a lot of innovations in uh, new devices come about, actually. Uh, but basically, uh, when they discovered it, they said that uh, uh, what happens in DRAM is uh, you have leakage current, of a cell. Clearly that's, that's the one that leads to uh, refresh. And that leakage current changes sporadically. Uh, once in a while that uh, charge gets trapped in the gate oxide of this excess transistor. And when that charge gets trapped, uh, the, uh, the charge you have in the capacitor uh, leaks out very quickly. Because there's a charge uh, trap uh, um, that, that, that enables the charge leakage to be much faster. That's the idea. Uh, and basically, uh, I already said this, I think, that leads to a short retention time. This is called trap-assisted gate-induced drain leakage, or TAGIDL. I think people reduce it to that. And it turns out it's a random process. Basically, there's a lot of evidence that this is a random process. People cannot model it really well. And in our paper that I mentioned earlier, we show that this, this, uh, this, uh, this variable retention time phenomenon is getting worse in newer devices. Basically, newer devices see more cells that look like this, and the spread of variable retention time is also increasing. Meaning that as the cell technology scales, it becomes worse and worse to find the minimum retention time of different cells. That's the idea. I think there needs to be more studies to be done in variable retention time, actually. It's fascinating. If people can understand the time spans better, uh, that, uh, that will be important. For example, you may need to test DRAM for days before you figure out the minimum retention time, because a cell may become good, may, may, look, may, may retain data for hundreds of seconds, for example, for three days. And three days later, randomly that charge uh, trap happens and trap becomes occupied and charge leaks quickly and you tank to 8 milliseconds, let's say. That doesn't uh, sound good, right? You don't want to be testing DRAM for a single cell for three days. <laughs> okay, that's the idea here. That's, that's the difficulty. Basically, the takeaway, the architectural takeaway, is worst case retention time depends on a random process. And if you really want to determine your refresh rate, you need to find this worst case despite this. And if it takes three days to find this, then it's too bad. If it takes 10 days to find this, it's even worse. 
So let me give you some examples uh, for some real data from that paper. Uh, that paper actually does the testing at a very low temperature. That's why you see retention times that are high. So retention time actually is very much dependent on temperature also. We didn't discuss this. Uh, we, we briefly discussed it actually, but we didn't uh, discuss this a lot. You can read the paper for more detail. Um, so uh, as, as you reduce the temperature, um, the, the cell leaks less. Actually, leakage rate is exponentially correlated with temperature. Uh, leakage increases a lot as you increase the temperature. So at low temperatures, there's no problem. DRAM can retain data for a really long time. As you can see, this is a test we've done. I believe it's at 45 degrees Celsius, which is low temp reasonably low temperature, which could be the common case, actually, in DRAM. Uh, but you could run into worst cases. So in, in modern DRAM, worst case is more uh, 85 degrees Celsius. Sometimes you go up to 95 degrees Celsius. Uh, but if you look at uh, this picture, these are devices that we've tested. These are real DRAM chips that we've tested in around 2012. And this is the retention time distribution that you see uh, in, in each of the devices. So this is the retention time you can see. Uh, what we plot is uh, if you reduce the refresh rate, to let's say three seconds, you figure out what, what is the fraction of the cells uh, that fail at that point in time. And that's what we're plotting over here. Which means that this is a fraction of cells that have retention time that is less than the x-axis value. <coughs> Does that make sense? So clearly as you increase the retention time over here, the number of cells that fail uh, uh, will, will increase. right? Because, but, the, but the distribution looks like this. Okay, so let's take a, let's go into some takeaways over here. So newer device families actually have more weak cells than older ones. This is likely a result of technology scaling. So let's take a look at this one. This is uh, manufacturer D, one gigabit chip. This is older generation. If you look at the newer generation from the same manufacturer, the retention time curve shifts left. Right. That means that the fraction of cells that fail at a given retention time point increases. And that's exactly the scaling problem. And this is true for all manufacturers, actually, that we've tested. This is an older generation from A, and this is a newer generation. You see that the retention time curve shifts left again significantly at the same temperature. And that's the scaling problem. OK, so you can do fun studies like this if you have an infrastructure like this. Right. OK, so this is uh, showing that refresh is becoming a worse problem uh, as, as scaling happens. This is another example. This is the variable retention time example. I think I've given you this example in the past, so I'm not going to focus on this that much. Basically, this shows that a cell has different retention times as you keep testing the cell. You can see the x-axis uh, x -axis in hours over here. And this may be a lucky case where you actually reach this retention time very quickly. But this may not be the lowest retention time, as you can see, right? There's a lower point over here. And maybe as you keep testing, you'll get to lower points. And there's a lot more data uh, in the paper. So this is another example uh, that shows that variable retention time is actually very common. So uh, here we're plotting uh, the failing cells. If you, uh, basically, you, you change the refresh interval, and you figure out if a cell fails. And for all of the failing cells, what we're plotting is the cell's minimum retention time and the maximum retention time. It's a density plot, meaning that darker points over here have a, uh, have a higher density of cells that fall into that point. I like the sort of graphs. So if, if there's no variable retention time phenomenon, what you would expect for all of the failing cells would be the x equals y curve, right? The minimum retention time of the cell should be the same as the maximum retention time of the cell. So which means that the retention time doesn't change over time, right? But that's not the case, as you can see over here. There are some cells that obey that in our testing. But you could also argue that maybe we don't test long enough. If you test long enough, those cells may actually not be on the x equals y curve. That's always a question. It's hard to answer that question, right? You, cannot do, you, can, only, you can do all, uh, testing only so much. But clearly, there's evidence, uh, against, uh, evidence for variable retention time. You can see that most of the failing cells are actually around here. And most failing cells actually exhibit variable retention time. And if you look over here, those are the really interesting cells. Basically, these are many failing cells actually jump from very high retention time to very low. This is the minimum retention time. It's 1. And the maximum retention time is 6.1. Actually, in, in our case, 6.1 is considered, it's not failing. 
because we actually uh, uh, we, we actually refresh at every 6.1 seconds. So it may be failing if you go to 6.5, but we don't capture that over here. That's that's why this plot actually ends at 6.1 over here. Make sense? Okay. So this is evidence that variable retention time is actually very common in a given chip. Okay. Any thoughts? Questions? Okay. So, um, actually, this, this, I believe, is one of the most difficult problems. That's why industry has been writing pa papers like this. And as you can see over here, this, this, this paper was written after our paper was published. But clearly, this is a known problem before. Our paper actually put a lot of data into the problem uh, and enabled other researchers to use the data. But this paper says that variable retention time is a difficult problem. And they actually propose error correcting codes inside the DRAM chip to actually correct this. So uh, remember, we discussed how to correct row hammer errors, right? In row hammer errors, having error correcting codes is not a good idea because it's a lot of overhead for a mechanism, for a failure mechanism that you know exactly how it induces errors. You can devise much simpler mechanisms to correct the errors. Here, variable retention time, you have no idea how this is happening. Well, you may have some lower level idea as to how this is happening, but you have no idea when this will happen because it's completely random. This is a perfect example for using error correcting codes. Again, the principle states that you should really adapt your error correction mechanism to the failure mechanism. And in this case, it's very difficult to find some other error correction mechanism than error correcting codes to fix these random errors. And that's exactly what the manufacturers have done. They actually added error correcting codes inside the DRAM chips because it was just too difficult for them to uh, test uh, DRAM to figure out all of these errors that happen due to variable retention time. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. Okay, and I've already showed this paper many times, but it's a, it's a good paper, basically. It's a, it's a four-page paper. It may not be written in the best way, but it's a, it's a very clean paper in terms of the... Uh, uh, in terms of the problems that it exposes and in terms of some of the solutions that it discusses. We'll get back to this paper later on actually. Okay, so let's take a step back and talk about how do we keep future memory secure. Uh, basically, we'll see more of these issues. Uh, by the way, any, any questions on this? Okay. We actually have a recent DSN paper uh, that some of your TAs wrote that talk about that reverse engineer the error correcting codes that's inside a DRAM chip. So DRAM manufacturers don't uh, provide what type of error correcting codes they use inside the DRAM chip. This is actually something that also needs to change, basically. Uh, the idea is that you put error correcting codes and you don't expose it to the memory controller. And in the end, what happens is you may actually correct some errors internally and nobody's aware of that. That may be good. But if, if the error correcting code is not capable of correcting some of the errors that happen in DRAM, what happens is the result that you get outside the DRAM chip is really weird. Meaning that it does some correction, it, it's not able to correct, it fixes some bits, but it changes a lot of bits in the meantime. As a result, you, you can make no sense of it. The, the guess you can have is maybe some error occurred. That's good. But you have no idea where it occurred. So this is, this, is a, this is another example where the communication between DRAM and the memory controller needs to become better. How do you actually distribute the responsibilities? Who does the error correction? And how do they communicate with each other? Maybe both of them do error correction, that's good. But maybe memory controller implements more sophisticated error correction mechanisms on top of the error correction that's inside the DRAM. Right? So this is something we may get into later on if we have time. I'm not sure if we will have time though. And we can have a dependable systems course for multiple semesters, actually. It's a fascinating topic. But this course, dependability or reliability is only part of this course. Okay, so let's talk about uh, this, basically. Given that uh, we have all these challenges and technologies, we've talked about DRAM, we briefly talked about flash memory, and we haven't really even touched these emerging technologies that actually have a lot of error mechanisms also. Some of them are similar, some of them are different. Uh, how do we actually keep future memory secure? I think this is a very good research direction that everybody's struggling with today. Not, uh, industry, certainly, but also research community. How do we design these fundamentally secure, reliable, and safe computing architectures? And you can see that I actually put these together. Even though these are different concepts, they actually come together if you have a bit flip. Never, uh, never forget that. If you have a bit flip, that could be a reliability problem, but that could also be exploited by someone and that could also affect your safety if it happens in a bad time, right? 
Think about a self-driving car, for example. If you have a bit flip in your pedestrian detection, it's a safety problem for that pedestrian. Okay. So I think uh, we really need to think about uh, how to design fundamentally secure computing architecture. And I don't have answers over here. I don't think anybody has answers at this point. But this is a, this is a place where we can discuss potential uh, future solutions. And maybe when you're uh, doing your work in the field 20 years from now, you will actually see this problem much worse uh, going into the future. I'm not sure if it will be solved by then. My feeling is I think we should really somehow predict and prevent such, uh, such issues, such reliability, safety, and security issues. And this is my three-step methodology for architecting for security, I think. Uh, I don't claim to know all of these very well. I think these are all research directions for, uh, clearly. First of all, I think we need to understand and model. Uh, we need to architect and we need to design and test. And I think we need to be principled in all of these. So what does understanding mean? Basically, we somehow need to model these vulnerabilities and discover these vulnerabilities. And this requires a lot of different types of things to do. But I think uh, we really need to somehow under, uh, do some modeling and prediction. We have some real devices. We have some models in circuits. Uh, and we can get, get device models. The question is, how do, we, how do we actually predict something like Rove Hammer before it happens? That's the question I will pose. I don't know if there's an answer to this yet. Uh, but if we actually understand these real devices really well and model them and build predictive models based on that, maybe we can guess. Right? So my, my, my example of this would be, uh, for example, if, if the industry had this mindset and if they were actually testing some of their older devices with these hammer tests, and if they were actually increasing the refresh interval while doing so, they could potentially see these row hammer errors, right? That's actually because row hammer is fundamentally how many activates you can cram into a refresh interval, right? And if you actually increase the refresh interval, even though you're not going to sell this device with an increased refresh interval, internally you may do some studies and you can increase your refresh interval. This is an aggravated condition. In a sense, in this aggravated condition, you're testing the device. And if you start seeing errors, now you record which refresh interval actually leads to those errors. And over time, you keep doing these testing over years. And you may actually see that the refresh interval at which you're seeing errors actually keeps reducing over time. Right? You can actually build a model that looks nice out of that. And that model can guide you at which point you will cross the refresh interval that you're currently using and that would lead to these errors, right? So that's the idea. That's, that's what I mean by uh, modeling and prediction based on real devices. And I think that's a very viable way of doing things, especially with scaling problems. Clearly with scaling problems, some, uh, as, as the circuit becomes uh, smaller, some, some reliability metric is reducing. And you really would like to capture at what rate it's reducing and at what rate, uh, at what point in the future it will be a problem, right? That's the idea. I think there's a lot of opportunity over here in terms of different types of error mechanisms. Growth hammer is one, retention time is another one. And there are other read, disturb er uh, read errors and write errors, could be other. Basically, this, this means that we need to understand the vulnerabilities and model them really well. Of course, we need to develop reliable metrics uh, to quantify these. This is, again, I'm mixing reliability and security over here, but this is true for security also. Like, how do we quantify how secure you are? I think it's easier to think about this from a memory perspective, but if you think about a processor perspective, like Spectre type of attacks, which we may talk about later on, it's a bit more difficult, actually, to develop the metrics. You need to figure out how much leakage you have from your cache, for example. Although I'm not sure if that's enough. Okay, so assume that you've understood really well. Then the next step is architecting, basically. How do you actually solve the problem? I think this requires uh, principled architectures with security or reliability as a key concern. This means also that you need to have good partitioning of duties across the stack. Like, I've given you examples from memory and memory controller. But this, similar examples exist in terms of security vulnerabilities like Spectre, right? Like, how do you partition the duties? Who should solve that problem? Should you punt on software? Should you punt on the compiler? Should you disable speculation? These are actually not so uh, easy questions. I don't think disabling something uh, like speculation is good because you'll see my next uh, point over here coming up. Not next, but next, next. Uh, well, next, I guess. <laughs> Basically, you cannot give up performance and efficiency. Because it's always a trade-off between reliability and security and performance and efficiency on the other hand, right? We've seen this in Rohammer, for example. You can increase the refresh rate a lot. That gives up performance and efficiency, but it improves your reliability and security. Right? It's very fundamental. 
That's true for spectral. also. You disable speculation, you get rid of your performance, you get rid of your efficiency also. A lot of people may think that speculation is actually not energy efficient, but most of the time your speculation is correct. Whenever you predict a branch uh, in, your, in your machine, more than 95% of the time that's correct. Which means that as opposed to stalling, waiting, which wastes power, you're really actually executing instructions correctly. Right? So speculation is actually good for energy efficiency most of the time. It's not good for energy efficiency when you mispredict. That's true. So in that case, maybe you want to stop it. But speculation by itself is most of the time energy efficient. It's also high performance, clearly, because most of the time you're correct. Okay. So I think patchability in the field is also uh, very fundamental over here. Basically, somehow we, uh, we need to enable these architectures because it's very difficult to expect, I think, to, uh, uh, to figure out all of the unforeseen consequences of the devices that we design, right? I think we're humans. We cannot anticipate everything going into the future. Clearly, I think a lot of evidence suggests that we're not very good at that. Which means that perhaps we should design the architectures such that we can patch them in the field, right? I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, and as we rely on these architectures as critical infrastructure, I think this is going to be much, much more important into the future. Okay, but there's a lot more over here, of course, like how do you actually, uh, this, uh, duties across the stack, duties across components. There's a lot to do over here. And the last one is, I think, design and test. This is different from architecture because uh, you need to develop a testing methodology, I think. When do you do the testing? How much testing do you do during manufacturing time? How much testing do you do online? How much of that testing is automated? How much of that requires human interaction? These are all actually very, very interesting questions. And I think all of, uh, in, in the end, you really need to somehow design for security from the ground up. Like today, when you build a gate at the hardware level, you don't think about security, right? You don't think about the information leakage that happens in the, inside that gate or inside that block. But maybe there should be design metrics when you actually put some block into your hardware. Maybe it should say, maybe automatically, it should say you've actually increased your security vulnerability by this much, ideally, right? I think that's a completely different design mindset in the end. That's really designing for security. We have some things like that for performance area, clearly, power efficiency, a little bit. You can do that. I mean, it's cumbersome. It's not perfect, but it's doable today for those metrics. But for a metric like security and reliability, we actually don't have. Reliability, we somewhat have it. If you have a test bench, for example, you add a module and you test it. And that may potentially give you some vulnerabilities. Maybe not for all of the reliability vulnerabilities, but security, we have no idea at this point. We have no idea uh, how, how, how uh, even a simple gate affects our security when we add it to a particular place in the chip. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. I think this field is going to become even worse going into the future in the sense that, first of all, whatever you add may, be, uh, may cause security vulnerabilities, that's true, uh, and reliability vulnerabilities can, may, can lead to security vulnerabilities, but there's also another aspect of this. Uh, the person who's actually designing the circuit may actually maliciously inject something that could actually attack you, right? Because how, uh, th then uh, th this boils down to how, how, who do you trust? In the manufacturing chain, someone may inject some gates that, got, that get activated with some input, potentially external input, and that could actually take over your system. Right? These are called hardware trojans, and I think this is a very interesting area of research at this point in time as well. So security is very multifaceted. Uh, there, there's a lot of interesting things to do. Okay, so I think, uh, I mean, we've, uh, as we've discussed, online testing is a good method. If you, if, if you keep on testing, if you have mechanisms that enable you to test the components once in a while, uh, that could actually lead to more reliable as well as secure designs. Like we've seen uh, with retention time testing, right? If you want to really adapt uh, to your retention time failures, maybe you should keep testing once in a while together with error correction codes or whatnot. But how do you design that is important. And I think this is true for se security as well. Okay, so I think this is a very loaded slide. There, there, there are not many solutions, but there are a lot of ideas in here. And you can actually go into each one of these and generate a lot more ideas. Okay, so I think uh, we're, we're, we're kind of taking steps toward this direction. Like clearly this infrastructure enables you to understand and model 
that's how we are able to understand roll hammer better. This infrastructure enables you to understand and model these flash memory, which I will briefly talk about, and then we will conclude the roll hammer lecture and then we'll take a break. Does that sound like a good plan? Okay. So let me very quickly talk about this uh, flash memory reliability. I already said actually most of what I wanted to say. Um, this is what I would recommend, but hopefully we'll have a lecture on flash memory also. And there's similar work in the area that I've discussed, but this is actually an interesting one. This is a paper that we've written recently uh, together with collaborators at Seagate. This actually shows that uh, some of the reliability issues in uh, flash memory programming, whenever you actually write one or zero to flash memory, you could expose some information. And that information can be used for exploits. Now, we didn't really show the exploit over here because I think the real exploit is very hard to build. It's theoretically possible. The question is, is it realistically possible? I think the, answer, uh, the jury is still out for that answer. I'm not going to talk more about this. You can, you can read the paper if you're interested. But there are a lot of interesting issues in 3D NAND flash memory recently. Uh, they're actually very, really, really interesting phenomenon. For example, uh, after you program flash memory, there is some time where the flash memory errors reduce. This is called self-recovery. And this is temperature dependent, so there, there are actually really interesting directions here. Maybe you can actually reduce the errors somehow. And there's actually, uh, we actually showed that flash memory is very much vulnerable to a phenomenon called early retention loss. This is kind of similar to variable retention time, but not exactly. I think this is modelable. Uh, it's not random. Basically, you can quickly lose charge after you program flash memory. And this is very much dependent on process variation. But I'm not going to talk about these in detail. But let's have some fun now. Any questions over here? Has anybody ever examined flash memory? Over here? No? Do you know how it operates? No? Okay. This is not normally discussed in any computer architecture course that I know, actually. But we will discuss it hopefully a little bit more. Okay. So let's have some fun. <laughs> well, it may, may look like fun, but it's not exactly fun. <laughs> but basically, we started with this, right? We have some critical infrastructure. Oh, sorry, I already spoiled the fun. <laughs> we have some critical infrastructure, and you get a bit flip, and your, your safety, reliability, and security all get threatened. And again, I think this is a critical infrastructure. I think computing is a critical infrastructure, much more critical than bridges, I think, going into the future. Bridges are very limited. They may look extremely critical, but the impact of computing will be much, much higher in, in human lives because it's everywhere, right? Bridges are not everywhere. But, but if you look at bridges, uh, I mean, even bridges we don't know how to build if you think about it that way. <laughs> like, this incident is not an isolated incident. This is 1994. Some of you may not have been born at that time. This is in Seoul, Han River. And this is actually a very bad incident where a lot of people were killed. This you may have remembered. This is in uh, Minneapolis in 2007. There were fatalities over here also. Looks terrible, right? Another bit flip. And this another bit flip. This is actually closer to here. This is in Genoa in Italy in 2018. Right? So these things are keep happening. So, okay, of course, it's good to ask the question, why is it happening? I'm not a civil engineer, so I'm not going to answer all of that question clearly. But I believe we can do better in computing compared to these things because I think it's very difficult to build a bridge that's patchable, right? Or extremely expensive, probably. Right? It's not a soft structure, it's a hard structure. But computing is all about soft structures, meaning that you could actually design a memory controller that's patchable, for example, and you could avoid such failures in the field. It's very hard to avoid these failures in the field, I think, uh, in, in immovable in infrastructure that looks like this, right? or unpatchable infrastructure that looks like this. So it's good to think about this analogy a bit. Even though we, we can actually do this in computing, we're not doing it, but we should probably be doing it going into the future. Okay, I think there's a lot of research questions over here also. Maybe, maybe 20 years from now, we will have a lot more patchable systems. Okay, so let me give you some final thoughts on Rollhammer. Uh, this is also what I presented a couple of days ago, so it'll be deja vu for me. So hopefully you may ask some questions. But basically, uh, I mean, we already discussed this, uh, so I'm going to skip this. Uh, how to exploit and fix the vulnerability requires a strong understanding across the transformation layers, I believe, but across the components also, and a strong understanding of the tools that are available to you. And we already discussed that fixing needs to happen for two types of chips. Okay. Oh, okay, I'm not, it's not final thought, sorry. <laughs> I had to talk about this also. Has anyone heard of Byzantine failures? Okay, 
How many people heard about Byzantine failures? Okay, where, where did you hear about these? You may not remember. It sounds familiar, sounds good, but <laughs> anybody? Probably a distributed systems course? If you've taken a distributed systems course, if it doesn't talk about Byzantine failures, that's an interesting distributed systems course. <laughs> it's possible, but it's <laughs> not easy. So Byzantine failures are actually very interesting. Um, basically, this uh, I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit more. It's a Byzantine general problem. I have actually a slide related to this. Uh, basically, you have... Okay, I'll, I guess I'll talk about it. Basically, uh, let's assume that you have a bunch of generals. Uh, Byzantine Empire. That's an empire. Uh, uh, and uh, you have a bunch of generals that uh, are supposed to attack a city. Right? And these generals... Uh, don't, don't have a global way of communicating with each other. They can send each other messages, uh, but they cannot communicate together at the same time. Now, uh, the question is, uh, they, they need to agree on a time to attack the city. And the attack will be successful only if the, all of the generals attack at the same time. So it's a classic distributed systems problem. How do you ensure that the generals actually agree on something in the presence of faults? Faults meaning you may actually send a messenger from this general to this general, and that messenger can get killed. The message may not be delivered. Or that messenger actually may be malicious. They may give the wrong message. Right? They may actually say, we're not going to attack, right? uh, we're, we're going to attack in the morning when they're going to attack some other time. Maybe they're actually traitors. Right? So in the presence of these faults, how do you actually guarantee that the attack will succeed? That's the idea. And there is a very strong theoretical result that was provided by Leslie Lamport in 1982 in the paper that I'm going to reference that basically provides bounds into this. Okay, so let me, uh, now that I'm, I've, I've uh, constructed the problem, basically you may have errors in these messages, right? And failure is essentially these errors that you have in these messages. And if you actually fail, this could be catast catastrophic, right? Basically you don't take over the city, but you also get killed. Okay, so these Byzantine failures are actually characterized by undetected erroneous computation. You can think of these failures as when you send these messages, you have some errors. <coughs> it could be real errors, or it could be malicious errors. But in the end, it's undetected computation. Computation is the message that's going on. And it's er erroneous. Now, these failures are opposite of fail fast. Basically, you either fail quickly with an error, or you give no result. Right? That's another way of failing, and it is a very good way of designing systems. So erroneous, as I said, can be malicious. You may have a bit flip, that bit flip could be a reliability problem or a security problem. Intent is really the only distinction, right? In this case, the messenger, for example, can die because somebody kills him or her, or the messenger can be a traitor, <laughs> can deliver a different message. It's the same thing from the perspective of whether the mission will succeed or not. Right. Okay, so it, it turns out it's very difficult to detect and confine these Byzantine failures. The, the solution is really do all you can to avoid them. By the way, this is a slide that's borrowed by uh, my former colleague Satya at CMU, who's, who's, who's really worked on distributed systems for his entire life. And he, he, he had uh, fascinating contributions to distributed systems. And he has multiple examples of these Byzantine failures in his distributed system class. And he recently added Rohammer as an example, uh, as a third example. He was always looking for a third example. And after he published Rohammer, he, he said that this is the third example for Byzantine failures. <laughs> okay, basically, you, you really need to do all you can to avoid them. And I think that's true for Rohammer also. And if you really want to know more about this problem, I would recommend... Uh, reading this paper. Uh, I would normally assign it, but it's, it's really out of the scope of what we have. Uh, actually, maybe we can read it right now since we're already over time. <laughs> so if, uh, this, is, this is a very fundamental paper in distributed systems. Uh, as you can see over here, reliable, let's, let's read it quickly. Reliable computer systems must handle mal malfunctioning components that give conflicting information to different parts of the system. This situation can be expressed abstractly in terms of a group of generals of the Byzantine army camped with their troops around an enemy city. Communicating only by messenger, the generals must agree upon a common ba battle plan. However, one or more of them may be traitors who will try to confuse the others. The problem is to find an algorithm to ensure that the loyal generals will reach agreement. It is shown that using only oral messages, and this is the theoretical result, this problem is solvable if and only if more than 
two-thirds of the generals are loyal. So a single traitor can confound two loyal generals. I would recommend you take a look at the proof of this. With unforgeable written messages, the problem is solvable for any number of generals and possible traitors. Applications of the solutions to reliable computer systems are then discussed. I think it's a really fascinating paper and I would recommend, if you haven't read it, I'd recommend reading it in whatever area you're studying or whatever area you would like to take it to. Uh, okay, that's where I stop. But Rohammer is that one example of these Byzantine failures. You may actually no, not know uh, uh, if, a je, uh, if a messenger has failed. Okay, so I think uh, let's revisit. So let's, uh, we, we've done a retrospective on Rohammer. So let me give you the final retrospective over here. So I think Rohammer is very interesting because, as I mentioned last time, it gave the security researchers a new mindset and enabled a renewed interest in hardware security attack research. If you remember, I showed you a paper from 2003 using memory errors to attack a virtual machine. People knew that these bit flips are bad for security, but no one actually followed up on it. But once Rohammer is discovered, it's clear that real chips are vulnerable in a very simple and widespread manner, in a programmatic way. Programmatically, you can induce these bit flips. You don't need physical access. And this causes real security problems, and that's the new mindset. And hardware reliability and security connection is not really mainstream discourse. And I think there should be more of this discourse. People really should not be hiding these reliability problems because that, that could lead to security issues. And clearly, I've given you examples of many new Rohammer attacks that were built. There's tens of papers in top security venues. There are apps you can download. And I believe there's more to come on this one because at the device level, at the fundamental level, Rohammer is getting worse. So if you look at, as you reduce the size of a cell, the number of vulnerable cells is increasing. And the number of activates you need to do to induce Rohammer bit flips is reducing. This is called the maximum activation count. And as technology scales, that maximum activation count actually reduces. Sorry, minimum activation count, not maximum. You only want the minimum activation count that leads to row hammer, right? And that is reducing over time. Right. Okay, this means that at the device level, it's getting worse. But at the system level, hopefully people are thinking about solutions, right? Like what we've discussed. So maybe attacks are becoming, going to become more difficult at the system level. But fundamentally, at the device level, the minimum activation count is actually going to go down and down and down as the circuit scales. Clearly, this is important also. Many new Rohammer solutions need to be developed, and people have been developing it. I've given you a bunch of examples. Uh, actually, there, there are many proposed in top venues. Latest one is in ISCA 2019, I believe, but this is an out of date slide, so there, maybe there's something newer than that. But I think the, the, the solution is really principled system DRM co design. And I think we've already advocated that in multiple works, uh, including the original Rohammer paper. But I believe there's more to come in this also. I think we really need to be thinking about new Rohammer solutions and new solutions related to Rohammer as well. But perhaps most importantly, I think uh, this shift of mindset in the security researchers is a good thing because it enables a different way of thinking about hardware, right? General purpose hardware is really fallible. It's not trustable in a widespread manner. It's actually interesting. If you go back 10 years ago, people really think of DRAM as perfect memory. You don't get errors, except for soft errors. But soft errors are basically that ha things that happen in particle strikes. It's very random. The error rates are very low, unless you go into space. Once you go into space, the error rates become very high. Uh, or unless you operate these things at 120 degrees Celsius or something, which is outside the operating range. Uh, so basically, people think of this hardware as perfect, but that's not true, right? So basically, Rohammer destroyed all of that. It's fallible completely. What is worse is its problems are exploitable, right? The simple bit flip you can exploit. And I think this mindset has enabled many system security researchers to examine hardware in depth, in more depth, uh, and understand the hardware's inner workings and vulnerabilities. Actually, uh, a good evidence of this is, I actually talked with many of these researchers, uh, but two of the groups that went on and discovered Meltdown and Spectre later on, they actually did a lot of early Rohammer security research. And they got really interested in all of these vulnerabilities in hardware. And they said, basically, they asked the question, can we actually do more? Are there other vulnerabilities that are inside? Uh, and they actually uh, had a lot of interest in Rohammer papers. They still have interest in Rohammer papers, if you look at their record. And I believe there's more to come in this area as well, meaning there's, there are more hardware vulnerabilities to be discovered. I, I think once you have this mindset, general purpose hardware is fallible, then you examine every single component that you have in the system, 
and you figure out the fallibilities, meaning the vulnerabilities in all of those components. And that's a very good mindset, I think. That's a very good mindset for designing much more secure and reliable systems. A very bad mindset is, I have this problem, but I'm going to hide it. <laughs> it's doable also, but it's only doable uh, for some time. And maybe that's actually really bad for, in general, for the public, because somebody may be exploiting it, right? And you never know who's exploiting it. But if once it's out in the public, it's a lot easier to defend against it, and you're actually much more careful. Okay, so uh, this is one of the final slides. Basically, I think DRM reliability is reducing. Uh, reliability issues open up new security vulnerabilities that not only I think there's a lot of evidence, clearly, right? And these are very hard to defend against. We call Byzantine, Byzantine failures. Roheimer is a prime example of this, and I've already said this multiple times. And the implications of this on system security research are tremendous and exciting. So, there are bad news and good news. Bad news is Rohammer is at a device level is getting worse. But the good news is we have a lot more to do. Meaning, we need to understand these devices better, find out other vulnerabilities. But most importantly, we're now fully aware hardware is easily fallible and its problems are exploitable. And we're developing both attacks and solutions, which is a good mindset. And we're developing more principled models, methodologies, and solutions, hopefully. I think there are a lot of attacks and solutions that are developed, that's good. But there needs to be more, a lot more work in this area. Like, how do we actually do this vulnerability modeling going into the future so that we can predict these things as opposed to exploiting existing vulnerabilities? It's prediction is always harder going into the future, right? Existing vulnerability, if you know, yes, you need to be very creative in terms of how you actually exploit the vulnerability and solve it. That's good. But this is a harder problem. Okay, any questions? Are people ready to take a break? Okay, so if you're interested in this, basically, this paper uh, covers like five years of Rohammer research, as I mentioned, at, at all levels of the stack, including the device and circuit levels, architecture levels, testing levels, as well as security and system software levels, and a bunch of solutions as well. And that's the end of the lecture.